the whole thing. He wanted to put it in QST because at the time he was really friendly with the CEO of the AWRL, and he had a, a good in. And they were not terribly supportive of uh, AM. I think they relented on that. They seem to be more uh, proactive in that area now. So, but anyway, make a long story short, I started looking into the history of AM, from AM and it, it fascinated me. Um, so the question is, who really invented it? Well, maybe you know this and maybe you don't, but it was a Brazilian priest. I know that sounds pretty shocking. The father of the military, Wendell de Moura. He was uh, ordained in 1866. He also studied physics and chemistry at the Gregorian University in Rome. He was ordained in Rome, by the way. He studied there to become a priest. He was ordained, and then he went to a school in Rome for physics and chemistry. And he began a real love affair with electronics. It was a new, interesting thing to him. So he came up with this invention, which we'll cover in a few minutes here. And eventually, and it was patented here in the US in 1904. <coughs> he tried to sell the patent, never really made it. And at some point, maybe around 1905, 06, the church said, hey, you're a priest, stop screwing around with the person about messing around. So he kind of had a wind back. But by all accounts, he was probably the first person to ever do an AM transmission, and here's how we did it. This thing looks a little bit like a, uh, well, you can see the spark gap here. That's pretty easy to see. And this thing that looks like a fire extinguisher is actually a sound chamber with a couple of additions to it. Uh, notice this thing here. We'll come back to that in a minute. This is a kind of a complex diagram of the way it worked. Simply put, he had his voice coming into this tube, going into this chamber. Now, a spark gap uses a spark coil. In this case, it was called a rum cord coil. And like any spark coil, including the ignition in older cars, or that's probably the best example, you have to interrupt the primary in order to get a big spike out of the secondary. And that's exactly what happens here. Except, and it uses a mechanical interrupter. Vibrator, vibrator power supply of old car radio was another good example of that. It uses a DC interrupter to key the primary to create the higher voltage of the secondary. Okay, so he reasoned that if I interrupt this at audio frequency, then I will transmit audio using a spark gap, and that's exactly what he did. Except, this was, I think, the world's first transceiver. Because if you notice over here on the side, that little earphone is connected to the same coil. Now, the way this worked in reality was, there's a switch over here, this number 11. You can close that switch, leave this one open, you're in a transmit mode. Talk into the mic. It goes to the antenna, away we go. If you then open this switch and close this one, the receiver is connected to the coil. Amazing. I mean, this blew me away. 18, he started demonstrating this around 1898. He was working on it in 1894, 95, that area. Just amazing. Now, the other guy that you heard about probably is Reginald Preston. He really, really perfected the art in many ways. Uh, and most people think he was number one. Well, they were probably about six to eight months apart. Uh, Fessenden uh, was a, a Canadian who lived, by the way, locally uh, down in Chester Hill, Massachusetts, a good deal of his life. Uh, he held over 500 pounds. He was just a genius, bottom line. Uh, his voice, first voice transmission was on December 23rd, 1900, probably six months after the good Brazilian priest did his. But he did it using a spark cap, and he reasoned, and, and it's kind of funny how he led to this conclusion. He was working on a spark cap transmitter with a technician, and it was on, and he was talking rather loudly to the technician. 
The funny thing is, the people at the other camp could hear him on the receiver. So they told him that. They said, wow, how can we capitalize on this? And he sticks a carbon microphone in the antenna lead. And lo and behold, they were, I mean, don't get too close to the microphone, folks. It had to be three areas, to say the least. But he also developed, uh, in concert with a fellow by the name of Alex Anderson, a, an alternating current smart pack generator. Uh, most smart caps were DC up to that point. Uh, so there were some rotary smart caps. This was an AC generator. It developed an AC voltage. Uh, in some cases, it moved a lot of power. Some of them were up to 500 kilowatts. Uh, but they were at very low frequencies. So he did this. He reasoned that, and most of them, by the way, would the carrier frequency, the number of sparks per second, would be fairly well up there. And he decided, I can drop the spark rate down to 800 hertz and see if I hear it. And lo and behold, he did. So then he started modulating that aspect of it. And it became quite feasible to do amplitude modulation using the spark pack. This is a station in Bright Rock, Mass. Uh, this is the Alexanderson alternator that was designed for this purpose, I believe. And I've read all kinds of different reports. I'm not 100% certain whether it was a 1 kilowatt or a 50 kilowatt. I've read both, so I can't tell you for sure. And this was the 420 foot tower. Now, in my uh, career as a broadcaster and microwave guy, a few other things, I've climbed towers taller than this. But I can tell you, I would never climb this tower. Just take a little look at it. Raymond Heisen. The name is very familiar, isn't it? Heisen Modulation. Master of, uh, Master of Science at NMSW University of Wisconsin. I went to work for Western Electric and Bell Labs. He was also president of the IRE. He developed several modulation systems, including the one that became the most popular when he gave his name, Heisen. He held over 100 patents. He also developed Class C power amplification. So this guy was pretty smart. Here's an example of Eisen modulation. A globe sheet, or rather a globe king 680, globe scout. Modulator tube down here, Eisen choke here, and it feeds both. And it feeds the, uh, the PA right here. If you look at the switch carefully, you notice that when it's in AM position, you're feeding current, or rather voltage to the screen of the tube that turning the tube on, and then the modulation is carrying itself up to the 6146. In CW mode, you can bypass the show by and turning off the screen of the 606 so that shuts off. And you'll notice, at least it only blows down, and you'll notice that the uh, PA current meter goes up when you do this, and that's why. Because the, the modulator is not growing anything. Lloyd Martin, this is a name you may or may not have heard. He was actually the father of class B modulation, another smart guy. Uh, went to work for GE Schenectady. Uh, actually did some work for the University of Arkansas. And he, I believe, graduated from the University of Arkansas. Stayed on for a while in the mechanical engineering area, but he got really interested in electronics. And somewhere around 1928 or so, uh, the school won a better radio station. And they gave him the project because he was so interested in it. Well, he looked at high school modulation and he said, nah, I don't like it. It doesn't work for me. And I'm going to read something to you from this. He thought it was inefficient, and in fact, it really was. Uh, from his own work, Barton said, the plate of the modulator tube is tied to the plate of the RF amplifier with a common core choke conductor supplying DC potential to both. As the input level to the modulator tube rises, the tube tries to draw more plate current, but the choke won't let it. As, as the common voltage drops, the RF amplifier gets less of its share to the antenna, and the current is reduced. As the audio level drops, things get back to normal. And the modulation 
tuition drops off. Again, changing current is consistent. So, in fact, it's just changing the amount of RF going to the antenna, basically. So he didn't like that. Uh, and in fact, he had good reason because what he came up with was a lot better. Here's an example of a class B modulator. Oh, by the way, if we go back here, you can see the basics that we just talked about in the globes cup. Modulator, choke, power amplifier. In this case, it was an oscillator, but same thing. Uh, modulated oscillators work unusually in other ways. The WLW 500 kilowatt AM transmitter in Cincinnati is probably one of the first shining examples of class B modulation used here in the United States. And this thing was the one I don't know if you've ever seen it. It is it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, it had two modulation transformers in the basement that stood as high as these rafters. And I've got a chance to. You said you could hear the modulation of the Admax vibrating. Right. Yeah, it put out an enormous buff, five, half a megawatt on AM at about 800 kilohertz, 870 or something like that. I can't remember the frequency. What, uh, what was your color TV trying to hear? What do you do for color TV? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let me go back to that. I did make a note down here about being a color TV pioneer. Uh, that is 100% true, and this speaks to his intelligence. In the old NTSC color system, it was phase dependent. When you change the tint control, what you were actually doing was changing the phase of the receiver. If the color phase that the station was transmitting was not correctly locked to your receiver, somebody's face would look green. So he figured out a way to send the color synchronization information to the TV receiver by putting eight bursts of 3.58 on the back porch of the horizontal St. Paul's. Pretty clever. We did it, the British did it, it became commonplace. This guy was, he was smart. So anyway, class B modulator, 500 kilowatts out, covered all of the US for the most part. Uh, and then there's this parallel class B modulation, which is kind of a quasi com combination of uh, Heising and class B. On the left side there is still a class B push pull circuit, but on the right side, what have they done? They put this inductor in here with a capacitor. What does that do? keeps DC off the modulator transformer secondary. So you don't have to insulate quite as highly. It's not as expensive, it's less dangerous. It was just another way to make things happen uh, better. It's also uh, reduces some of the storage because the flux fields that, that build up in the secondary influence what happens in the primary. They kind of cure in each other a little bit in a little way. Next guy is William Dory. He's another name you probably haven't heard much about. And for a good reason. He came up with a very brilliant idea that really reduced the cost of operating an AM radio station. But it is not AM friendly. Anyway, you can see that he was a pretty accomplished guy. Harvard MS worked for at and National Computer Standards, and ultimately Bell Labs. He was behind a lot of the Western Electric Transfer Developments, AM Transfer Developments. Um, let me just talk about the technology a little bit. The Doherty Principle includes a main amplifier, this guy up here, and what they call a peaking amplifier, which is this guy down here. This main amplifier operates in class B, so it's linear. And it only operates up to the point it only, it only amplifies up to the point, the modulation end is up to the point of the carrier. You got a 100 watt carrier and you're speaking and it gets to 100 watts. That's where this guy's efficiency drops off and this guy picks up. And he adds to it. The peaking tube adds the amount of modulation needed above that level to complete the cycle. If you look at a day of modulation, you see the, the little uh, balloons, I guess. Up, down, up, down, up, down. And you see a carry, and 
and that filled in the piece in the box that is about 40% more efficient than just a standard Class C amplifier. And here's a practical application of one. This is a 50 kilowatt continental fan broadcaster. Why am I talking about this? Because these things were very phase dependent. You can tune them up and they can work real well. But if you've had to change frequency, you also had to change the phasing elements. So that's why I've never really worked with amateurs because we change frequencies pretty darn often, especially on HF. So it's not practical for that. But now in this day and age, Doherty modulation has come back. It's been used in uh, commercial broadcast television transmitters, DTV transmitters. For the last, uh, well, for about two years, I worked uh, managing television transmitter installations for a company that was aligned with Roma Schwartz. And Roma Schwartz used the Doherty principle exclusively in their broadcast TV enterprise because you have microprocessors in there. If the frequency has to be changed a little bit, the microprocessor will change the phase for you over a certain range of frequencies. Pretty ingenious, but very efficient. Pulse width modulation. This is the current thing you can hear about in, uh, in audio when it comes to AM transmission. PWM or PDM. Now the pulse width modulation is a system you're generating pulses that are narrower or wider depending on where you are with speech, with the sine wave. In pulse density modulation, it's fewer or more pulses. They're all uniform, but there are more or less of them depending on where you are in the sine wave. Now here's a, thanks to uh, Steve, WMQAX and his great website, there's a, a nice diagram of how this works in practical reality even for us as a matter of fact. Brand new generator, pulse generator, pulse modulator, filter network to get rid of all of that stuff that you heard about, you know, all of the pulses before it gets amplified. Our amplifier can be anything you want, pretty much. You could go with class B if you want, there's no benefit to it since class C works. And now we're talking about classes actually C through H, these things are up into the output. So, enough of the technology. Let's have some fun with hardware. Why are, why are people interested in this stuff? And why is my screen and all that stuff I'm talking about? Thank you. Anyway, so why are hands interested in AM? Well, I'm in category number one. Baby boomer, been doing it for most of my life. I get a kick out of it. But newer amateurs now have a chance to learn about the history of it and, and see what it's like to hold a tube type transmitter as well as some of the more modern transmitters and get on AM and have some fun. There's literally something for everybody in AM. And there's a lot of people on that have some really good sounding fun. I'll show you something in a minute here. Uh, in fact, I showed you just a little bit ago. The GPR90 that I'm using these days, I've got a few other receivers as well. But when you listen with a good quality receiver to some of the guys in the 75, they sound better than WBZ, and I'm not kidding. Their audio is cleaner, smoother, less distorted, it's just great. Now, some of the names out of the past, you recognize these, and I don't have to really read any of them. But these are people that were involved in both AM and in many cases, side as well. Some of the more popular AM transmitters. There's one of these for sale out here uh, at, the, at the Fester. One of these for sale also. I haven't seen one of these this year. Uh, and this is the one I lost, unfortunately. It went away. But these are some of the most popular AM transmitters you'll find out there. There are a few more. The Ranger, the, uh, the Globe Scout. You'll notice that the Globe Scout is no slouch. See how far over the speaker is leaning when it's turned up and on the air. Of course, I'm hiding the fact that it's got a five watt slug in it, but never mind that. Um, <laughs> just, just kidding. <coughs> I have my granddaughter to thank for sore throat here. Not sore throat, but losing my voice. The 
EX40, control carrier modulation. The carrier sits at a kind of quiet point when you talk and jumps up like double side man, really. And the Viking uh, ones and twos, these things are built like a tank. They're, the only thing they're missing is a built in vehicle. Boy, they are some good transmission. You do have to work on most of these to get them to sound better, but very popular stuff. Now, if you want to get into the big iron, this is the way you do it. Technical Materials Corporation uh, was, on, was in New York, and they started around early 1950s and went through some general, actually up to 1990, I think, when a, when a company finally got this all done. If you want some big iron, the GPT 750B2, uh, this is a pair of 4400s, and in this uh, center section is a pair of 810 modulators, and this is the power supply that handles it all. These are bought primarily by the Navy and a few other uh, commercial aspects. But they, they also made, this is just a 750 watt hour. They also made transmitters up to 50 kilowatts. So they knew what they were doing. Uh, the other one, if you can't find one of these and you still want to spend a few bucks and have a really robust transmitter, is to get the B2 version, which has a multi mode exciter down here. That covers AM, CW, upper sideband, lower sideband, and both sideband simultaneously. Talking about screwing some of these down at 75. Um, they're quite, you can find them. They're a little rare nowadays, but you can find them. And also, you need three men and a couple of donkeys to move them. Some more of the big stuff you'll find around. Again, surplus, T368, very nice transmitter. Single, I believe it's a single 4400 modulated by a pair of 4 1.5s. Uh, and the venerable BC610. These were available from version A all the way up to, I think, version G or H, something like that. This is one of the earlier ones, just like, just like intelligent by the cabinet. A single 4 250 modulated by a pair of, uh, I'm sorry, a single 250th modulated by a pair of 100 ths Try to find those tubes. And now we're talking. You know, is there any way I can get rid of this uh, little bar on top? Put that red spot there. Uh, it's yeah. hard to read the screen over here. The red bar is to stop sharing. I get a little X on the corner. Oops. Barely see what you want. I get rid of that. Now see, now you know why I want to get rid of it. My joke for the day. I always wanted to say I have big jumps. No, that's fine. Thank you. That'll work. Uh, Johnson have made some pretty hefty duty transmitters. The 500. I've only seen one or two of those. And the Viking just kill a lot. This was a single 4 400 pair of A11s modulation. This was a pair of 4 250s pair of 810s modulation. They were definitely made. What's the model of the upper left? What model is that? This guy here? Yeah. That's a Viking 500. That's 500. Right. It actually is kind of similar to the uh, Globe King, but this thing works. That's the real difference. Mm -hmm. i got a quick question. So, when we're showing some commercial transfers, we're talking about wider AM or commercial residential. I was talking about commercial transmitters only because they were the ones who developed most of these schemes for the most part. And just to kind of bring that into the amateur world at this point in time. Yeah, I mean, people built a lot. Actually, back in the early days, people built things for the most part. There were some commercial transmitters available right through, including columns. But um, there were commercial AM, commercial transmitters of any kind were a little bit later on. But, you know, these are, these are, when you say commercial, you mean commercial of 
this variety or this commercial of or whatever in the broadcast AM? Yeah. Yeah. It was just, again, it was just because they were the ones that really used some of the innovations first off. This is the biggest thing that I think a ham ever could have bought, or the most pricing anyway, that was still a ham transmitter, the Collins KW1. Another pair of 250s modulated by eight tens. But take a look at the price tag. In 1952, it was $3,850. You probably could have bought a house of two Chevys for that. I mean, is it any wonder they only sold 150 of them? This one in the photo, by the way, is serial number 151. I happened to see it at the home of uh, Mac McCullough, 25 HPM down in Dallas. And it was built for Faust and Gonset, you know, Gonset communicators. It was Faust's personal transmitter. Uh, and he had to coerce Art Collins into building it because Art said, we're not building it anymore. And Faust called up and said, please, please build it for me. So he did. And Mac is the guy that wound up with that one. He still has it now. I sure hope so. Trying to find one of those today at any price is, uh, is quite a challenge. Military. Another source of AM transmitters and receivers for that matter. TCS 12, I saw one of those for sale out here. I've seen these out here, the uh, ART 13. Uh, R392, I have one of these, I kind of like them. Uh, they're very good. Venerable R5 transmitters and their matching receivers. This is a T195, which matches this guy. This is kind of an interesting transmitter. Stay away from this. Auto tune, kind of a thing in the neck. They do work well. Single uh, 4X150, I believe. I think it's modulated by a pair of vertical cords. Now, this is another aspect of the AMers rehabbing some commercial broadcast transmitters. Uh, this is a Gates BC250. Uh, and this is a, uh, an AM100 by ITA. Uh, these were pulled out of service, actually they weren't in service, they were standbys at a station in Massachusetts. This one was destined for my basement. The only problem was, this cabinet was wider than my basement door. And since the basement door leads into my wife's office, um, the transmitter never got inside the house. This one I probably could have fit, but it was a wreck inside, so I said, but anyway, you'll find not only gates, RCAs and Collins and Continentals and a whole bunch of other lower powered AM broadcast customers in the hands of hands now that have refurbished them, put them on 160 or 75, and they sound awesome. Uh, a fellow that I met through the Collins Collectors Association, J.B. Jenkins, who passed away a couple of years ago, was a real collector, and he restored this 30J. Probably the prettiest Art Deco ish transmitter you ever want to see. And he also restored all of these columns, uh, transmitters and these collapses, no columns, receivers that are transmitters. Including what you can't quite see is the homemade version and reproduction of Art Hall's first spark cap. Uh, Gary Halverson, if you read Electric Radio, you see Gary's name mentioned fairly often. This is his uh, place in San Jose. Another 30J and a whole bunch of other really esoteric but beautiful looking restorations. Now, favorite receivers for right now. This, when I listen around, this is what I hear. People I really love with the R390As, um, 51J4s. Uh, this is a rack that I have at home. This is a Raycal RX17. You'll see these in James Bond movies. This little dial up here has a 35 millimeter film sliding by it to turn the kilocycle off. But it's resolution down to one, one kilohertz. Great sound. It goes out to uh, the IF family, it goes out to about 13 KC. So it sounds really good when you listen to it. NC303 is a really popular one. Uh, it's got great sounding audio, it's got noise limiters that really work. Uh, IF shift, IF bandwidth controls, 51J4. So, there's also another place you can go. Try an SDR receiver. How many here have got one? Don't you like it? 
Which one do you have? Which one I can't, I'm sorry, my, I got a terrible case of tonight. There are two RTLS PRs personally, but that's not counting all of the NSX PRs Oh, yeah. You can get to one of the web, right? Well, I've tried all of these that are uh, the ones that I like. The one I like the most was this uh, AirSpot HF Discovery. And this thing is absolutely fantastic. 170 bucks. And uh, it is almost as good as my K3 in many ways when I listen around. It's got great selectivity. Great sensitivity, and the audio coming out of it is fantastic. You can do synchronous detection with it. It is done. For that amount of money, it's just astounding. These are the RTL SDR dongles that the marriage version 3, particularly, is one thing to $30. What's your audio change? Sorry? What's the audio change between that? You wind up well, you use computer audio. Right. And feed it into whatever you want. I just use earphones for the most part, but I have these still good. Yeah, and that's it. I've got a, a Crown B75 I can feed things in there too, and a couple of my speakers if I really want to do that. But that's up to you. I mean, the amount of control that you have over what goes on with the AGC, with the threshold, uh, with the gain, with the bandwidth, uh, with the type of detection. Uh, it's good for AM, sideband, CW, you name it. Uh, I've also got one of these uh, SDR plays. Which is good, but I have to say that I like SDR Shark, which is a software that's used for these two guys a little bit better. It's a little more user friendly. The uh, SDR Play software isn't quite as uh, as playable. This box down here, uh, this circuit board, was developed by another friend of mine, uh, Bob Nickel, W9. Uh, yeah, it'll come to me. Anyway, he sells these things through AC Canvas. It's actually a TR switch, called it the Versa TR switch. And it's mainly done for SDRs. It protects them. If you have a 100 watt transmitter, this will shut off the receiver before anything happens once you start transmitting. So it's instantaneous response. And it can be automatic or it can be triggered. And it can handle multiple receivers, which is kind of nice. Uh, it's quite good. Or maybe go full SDR. I've heard so many SDRs on 75 and 40, not just sideband, by the way, on AM, and they sound really awesome. You get, if you know Jeff, by the way, Jeff Mendenhall, uh, W9GNM, who was pictured in this photo, uh, was the VP of engineering for Harris Broadcast in the radio side of things. Uh, Jeff and I, when I was with Harris, uh, I knew Jeff quite well. So we still, in fact, we chat on sideband about every week right now. Yes, I'm 75 years. Many broadcasters would be busy working with the gaming industry. Of course, Jeff always sounds good and always sounds loud. But you notice he's got some speech processing up in here that uh, kind of helps the SDR out. And down here, I believe this is the Flex 6600M, which is manual. Very nice little radio. Like I said, it always sounds awesome. How about the K7 DYY? This is a the equivalent of the Johnson Desk Pillow in a 2 RU. Go figure. And it's a PDM modulated class, a PWM modulated class D. It'll put out 375 watts of carrier all day long. And it throws about 5 amps from the power line. This is cool stuff. Unfortunately, it's pricey, but not as pricey as an SDR radio. Well, maybe it is actually. I think they're about 15 million something like that. So they're out there, and they're pretty cool. So is AM still relevant? In my opinion, in my opinion, you have any sweet ass dishes.
time when you find a broadcast transmitter, they're available. People just want them the heck out of it. <laughs> and, you know, you see them advertised in electric radio and a few other places for stupid money. Somebody's making this one too bad. Well, they are talking digital, but... Yeah. That's the, that actually is the next thing. I just read that recently. Yeah, Harris actually just came out with it, well, not recently, but Gates Air. They now do digital modulation of mobile. Well, as you probably know, the HD that's on the air right now in AM is going to get an AM transmitter and an HD transmitter as well. It's not terribly efficient. They're only allowed at least, I think, something like 10 to 20 percent. They may have changed the rules. Originally, it was 10 percent, uh, and then they went to 20 percent. But I don't know what's going to happen after that. Uh, Europe is going in that direction, for sure. Right? Right. So you might see it here. But it's going to be a long slide to get there. I fear for AM, honestly, because you know, it's got the range that it doesn't have. Our radios is what sell, actually. And they were really reluctant to go HD for the longest time. And even now, I mean, if I'm tuned to an AM station, you know, I won't necessarily automatically switch to the HD one I want to. I gotta go find it up on the FM band. What a pain. Depends on which car you're talking about. Yeah? Someone someone remember Personal, but not well, the charging system is one of these things. Once you have a neighbor that moves in and has a cordless charging system to drive for electric. Oh, wow. That I talk to my hand on podcast. There's a great interference. Expert. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Europe, it's already. It's already really and broadcasting. Ah. And he projected that 10 years from now, the hand will be broadcasting. Sorry, Sorry. Which, You know, also, it doesn't look good for a hand right No. <laughs> that's another, you know, that's another uh, thorn on our side, to say the least. 160 meters in the dead water. Forget it. signals that appear as you're driving through certain neighborhoods. You get QI. I've noticed that I live in Sun Lake and I'm close to Reagan and Massachusetts. And man, I'm just driving through neighborhoods and suddenly the station I listen to gets interfered with tremendously. I don't know what's going on. I know how Carl I carry it. That's pretty much far away right now. Anyway, anybody else? Yeah? So, I get out of the meter, sometimes 40, 50 a.m. And what I'm hearing about when I notice like the bent and hollow lump box, you know, the fixer. And I'm like, I never should get out of the meter. Six meter a.m. is active on 50.4, I guess, on Sunday morning at 6 a.m. so mm -hmm. you can get off. That's yeah. what I thought. Yeah. I have an AM equipment for saying, you think I'm going to get up at 6 a.m. on Sunday morning? No. They're made at 9 at night. Right. Yeah, there are, there are pockets of activity. Right. But you got to leave them, receive them on as well, so wait. Yeah. Well, I guess 80 and 40 on the bread and butter the AM okay. yeah. activity. Yeah. I mean, you know where to listen there. Right. And there's always a bunch of people pontificating. <laughs> it's fun. Actually, I look forward to the AM rallies when they come around. They're, they're the most fun. Yeah, you have any questions? Mm -hmm. On 75, on 75. Yeah, I mean, do you still operate the TV for me? Uh, you can. Yeah. Yeah, the aircraft and the TV. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm going to get two. And my six. I used to get on two meters when we were in Washington. So, well, actually, the meters were there, but there was a small band of frequencies between 146 and 147. But now satellites are using that, so, you know, there's always encroachment somewhere. A little bit of trivia. 
How were you? And I it was just a song. I know how old you were. Well, thank you. Thank you. The funny thing about cycle 19, which was the most awful, you can read about this in all the magazines, was that here I am in the office, and I'm seeing this on six meters, and I'm thinking, this is wonderful. It's just, it's always going to be this way. I had no idea there was a sunspot. So, you know, some years later, it crashed. Yeah. Thinking my receiver's more than And nowadays, I know that. I mean, we're using receivers. Like, I have a pass for S38. Oh, yeah. And I couldn't meet it. Dead. Yeah. I mean, you know. No RSA, single conversion. Yeah, I know. Dead. 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 Really? Wow. Well, it's a hey, I miss mine. I don't get on anywhere near as much as I should, but I think I'm going to start to get on a little more often now. Hope to hear some of you guys there. Thanks for coming, folks. I appreciate it.